Okay, I am here this week, next week, and then I'll put all the All right. So if you haven't gotten coffee, don't worry. There'll be breaks later in the day. And welcome, everybody. I'm Carmel Shakar. I'm the faculty director of the Health Law and Policy Clinic at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, which it is a mouthful. And before we start the day, I really wanted to take some time to welcome you. I see some familiar faces in the crowd, including some past clinic alumni. But for those of you who don't know us, Chilpi, as we like to refer to ourselves, because that acronym works much better than our full name, is a clinical teaching program of Harvard Law School, where we advocate for legal, regulatory, and policy reforms in health and food systems with a focus on health, public health, and food needs of systematically marginalized individuals. And we do this through a host of different avenues, including conversations with policymakers, providers, grassroots advocates, and community-based organizations, as well as through scholarship. Today, I'm so excited, the Chilpi team is so excited to welcome you all because I think it's a really diverse set of viewpoints and voices that are in this room. And we're gonna talk about policy changes that have really an amazing potential to transform and improve individual and public health outcomes for communities that are impacted by our justice system. These policy changes, and here I particularly want to flag the Medicaid 1115 waivers, which our keynote speaker will unpack for us, really have the potential to be transformative in ways such as breaking down silos between the correctional health care system and community providers, which have too long been separated, finding new ways to address health-related social needs of people re-entering the community, and reinvesting in the health of communities disproportionately impacted by both incarceration and chronic health conditions such as mental health issues, substance use disorder, HIV, and hep C. We know that it has taken a lot of work to get to this point, and by a lot of work, I don't just mean the amazing work on behalf of the Chilpi team, including in particular Liz and John, who have really made this day a reality. So a big thank you to Liz and to John, who I don't see in the room, but I'll have to embarrass him some other time. But also work that I think a lot of you guys have been doing right before I kick this off. I was talking about how sometimes health policy, really transformative health policy starts as lone voices in the wilderness pockets of people who really understand what it's going to take to make a big change and then slowly support grows and becomes a chorus and those ideas get more accepted and more implemented and I think we're really in part of that cycle right now. So we know that it takes a whole community approach to set up new innovative policies for success and that prioritizing the voices of people with lived experience as well as those people who provide health and other services to people leaving incarceration is going to be an essential part of this work when it comes to this topic. Yesterday I was talking to a few people who came in the night before about how the worst health policy happens in a vacuum and the best health policy is responsive to communities saying, this is what we need. So I wanna to say today is neither the beginning of the conversation because I want to honor the work that has happened to get us to this point. And it is certainly not the end of the conversation because I think there's a lot of work left to be done here. But hopefully it's a really key juncture, perhaps a midpoint. We brought a lot of different voices to the table today to explore and highlight the insights that each of them bring, ensuring that these policy changes achieve their potential. So we hope you'll make some great connections today and that you'll stay in touch with Shilby and our partners as we all continue our work in this area and many others that intersect, such as access to healthcare for people with chronic conditions 
and policy opportunities to address health-related social needs. A few plugs, a few shameless, shameless plugs before we start. So we have a QR code that is posted here, as well as kind of around the conference, and we send out twice a month a newsletter called Healthcare in Motion, which highlights innovative health policy things happening that impact people living with chronic conditions and disabilities with a special focus on HIV and hepatitis C. We promise that if you sign up for it, you're only going to get those two monthly emails. You're not going to get a whole bunch of random other stuff from us. I also want to thank our partners in hosting this event, including the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute, the Teaching Palm Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School, the Harvard Health Law Society, the Institute to End Mass Incarceration, also at Harvard Law School, as well as the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. You guys have been amazing partners. Now, some purely logistical information for the day. So we are going to start with a keynote. Then we will have four panels spread throughout the day. There are schedules available in the program and posted. Coffee and snacks are right now available. We will feed you throughout the day. That is my promise to you. And lunch is available for everyone in this room starting at 12.30. You'll be set up out there, and then feel free to eat here. Or for those of you who are New England folks and used to these temperatures, you can eat outside. We'll also have a light reception in the room next door at 5 p.m. Now, the most important piece of information, the bathrooms. You go out into the hallway, and then you're going to make a right, and then you're going to kind of loop around and make another right, and the bathrooms will be right there. If you start walking down a hallway with many photos of people in very nice suits, you've gone too far. If you're going up and down flights, there are bathrooms on every floor, but you've also gone too far. Public Wi-Fi is available throughout the Harvard campus. You don't need a password to log in. Let us know if you're experiencing difficulties with that. I do want to flag that these sessions are being recorded. So come find us if there's an issue, but the recordings are mostly focused on the speakers and the panelists. We don't have like multiple camera sitcom style to capture alternate shots. <laughs> so with that logistics out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Vicky Wachino. She is the founder and executive director of the Health and Reentry Project, or HARP which is also a really good acronym. A catalyst for improving the health and safety of people and communities. HARP pioneers stronger policies and practices to expand access to healthcare for people who are directly impacted by the criminal justice system and bridges gaps between healthcare and criminal justice leaders and stakeholders. Vicky has spent her career leading and inspiring organizations that make a difference to people most in need. She has served as Deputy Administrator for the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services from 2015 until 2017. Under her leadership at CMS, the United States made major gains in access to affordable health insurance coverage, the availability of mental health and substance use treatment, and achieved stronger, more accountable healthcare delivery systems. Vicky has also worked in the White House Office of Management and Budget and the Kaiser Family Foundation. She has a Master's of Public Policy degree from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Mount Holyoke College. Vicky is going to go into more detail about 1115 Medicaid waivers and other policy changes in progress the goals of these programs, and how state Medicaid agencies and others can work to ensure that these programs live up to their goals. So with that, I want to extend a warm welcome to Vicki. Good morning. 
It is so great to be in a room of committed people who want to spend time thinking about the pathway forward for people who are involved in the justice system. Thank you all for coming. OK, thank you to Chilpi for organizing this meeting. Um, I've worked with Chilpi for a long time. And I will say the fact that they're bringing us together around this topic is so consistent with their commitment and mission to raising up issues that affect health care for millions of people, but, but don't get enough attention. So I'm really grateful to you all for bringing us together today. Standing here today, we can say something that no previous generations of Americans have been able to say, which is that 92% of Americans have health coverage. That is historic and unprecedented in the United States of America. We have so much to be proud of. It's the product of legislation, specifically the Affordable Care Act and the American Rescue Plan, and the product of hard work on the part of federal officials, state officials, local officials, providers, to get us there over many, many decades. Some of you who contributed that are in this room. Thank you. Um, uh, but the challenge we face as a society is that although that coverage has brought benefits to many people, people have much greater financial security than they did before they had health coverage. They have much better connections to doctors and other forms of providers. They have better health. We still face a lot of social gaps. Uh, think about the, the, the challenge just in healthcare and the health status of Americans, which is that for the first time in a generation, life expectancy in the United States is decreasing. And that is the result of people who have fairly common chronic conditions that aren't getting services. It's also the product, to a lesser extent, of our national crisis with substance use disorder and deaths related to opioid overdoses. But the problems, we shouldn't just look at the problems that face us in health. We should think about what are the challenges that face Americans in their day-to-day -day life. Public safety is clearly one of them. There is a perception and a concern on the part of millions of Americans about safety in their communities. Curiously, this isn't always supported by the data because crime nationally is actually not increasing. Some forms of crime are increasing. And whether the national data suggests a problem or not, if you're living in a community that is infected by crime, you have legitimate reason to be concerned. Think of the mother, the single mother, who would rather have her child sit inside and play games uh, or be on their phone rather than go outside while she's at work and can't get childcare because it's safer for her child to be inside. Think of the workers who want to be able to take public transit to work uh, and feel safe in doing so. We're not realizing that opportunity for enough people. And concomitant with that, we face national challenges in access to housing, uh, rates of homelessness that in some places in the United States are quite troubling. And too often, we're not meeting the promise that we should be making to people around economic mobility. Too many people who are poor are passing that poverty down from generation to generation. What does all of this have to do with our topic today? Fundamentally, I think what the challenge that we face as a country is access to health care, but not access to health care writ large. Access to health care for specific populations of people who are struggling. And the thesis of my presentation to you this morning is that if we're able to fill that gap, specifically for people who experience the justice system, we have the opportunity to achieve multiple goals as a society. We have a chance to increase life expectancy. We have a chance to build safer communities. We have a chance to build more connections to housing. And we have a chance for people to climb up the social ladder, to get jobs, to go to school, things that almost every American would recognize as a common goal for themselves and a common goal for others. And that's what I think the potential of this policy is. So what I'm going to do with you this morning is talk a little bit about where we are now and why this is a problem. 
And then we'll talk about why the movement for change, how is it that access to healthcare can achieve change, why Medicaid is really the ideal lever for achieving change, and then we'll talk about where we go from here. Because as exciting as it is that 21 states now have submitted Medicaid waivers to CMS, as exciting as it is that Congress has made the first ever statutory changes to Medicaid for when people are incarcerated, the real work is in implementation. So let's start with why our current situation is challenging. First, this is not a small population of people we're talking about when we talk about the justice system. 440,000 people leave prisons every year. Seven million go through jails over the course of a year, and somewhere between four and six million are in the community correction system, plus about 40,000 in the juvenile justice system. But because, as you've already heard from Carmel, these systems have been siloed, uh, we get very, very bad health outcomes. The work I'm presenting to you this morning is the is things that we've learned, the, the, um, the perceptions we've gained from three years of the Health and Reentry Project. Uh, as you've heard, I founded HARP three years ago specifically because uh, I and several other health system leaders with experience in public health, solitary confinement, community health, and social work came together and saw an opportunity to accelerate change in this area. We rely heavily on building bridges across the health and criminal justice system and convening. And we have been working and listening for three years and are happy to share the results of that work with you this morning. Margaret cronin Furman, HARP's chief of staff, is here with me today. You'll hear over the course of the day from two of our advisory committee members, Sheriff Peter Katusian and Emily Wang, um, and David Ryan, our strategic advisor, is also here today. In addition to many people, state officials, local officials, that we've talked to over the past three years. So let's jump to why these millions of people uh, who experience the criminal justice system um, are in such a challenging place. Many people come to prison and jail with a set of health needs that are quite acute more acute, significantly more acute, than those of the general population. And that's true of common chronic conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes. It's true of infectious diseases like hepatitis. And it's true of mental health conditions and substance use disorders. And people don't acquire these conditions when they get into prison and jail. They're coming to prison and jail with them. And for many of them, although they have a significant health need, they haven't necessarily accessed community health services in years. So many, not all, but many are coming into the system with significant unmet need. Because people who are poor and people who are black and people from indigenous groups are significantly more likely to be incarcerated than other people are, the burden of this illness and of our failure to meet their needs falls most heavily on them. The outcomes of this system are troubling, and they're particularly troubling at reentry. People in the weeks following incarceration are 12 times more likely to die of multiple causes uh, in the weeks following release. The standout statistic is deaths from opioid overdose, which exceed those of the general population by a factor of somewhere between 40 and 129, depending on which study you choose. And people who are um, leaving incarceration have extremely high rates of homelessness. So you can see across the board, we're getting bad outcomes. Emily Wang, who you'll hear from later, has done some excellent work showing the impact of these deficits on the healthcare system, specifically rates of emergency room and hospital use that are very high in those first weeks post-release. And troublingly, although I'm focusing on these first weeks post-release, longitudinal data show that for some people, the impact on their life endures for generations. Uh, one study looked at Medicare beneficiaries over 40 years, and the outcomes for black Medicare beneficiaries were significantly worse than those for white Medicare beneficiaries. So there's lasting impact over the lifespan. Homelessness is an issue that we're, like, many people are concerned about, um, and we're not making connections 
at reentry. We have one member of our advisory committee, uh, we have several who are, have been directly impacted, and he told us that when he left prison, he was out on the street, he was homeless. Who did he turn to for support? Who did he turn to to find housing? Who did he turn to to find health care? Other homeless people. And it's great that they were there for them, but it probably would have been better if he'd had some other supports. The impact of these deficits in our healthcare system is significant. Uh, it results in spending in the healthcare system in the wrong settings. We spend a lot of time as healthcare leaders talking about how can we deliver the right care in the right place at the right time. We're not, and we're paying for it. We're also spending more in the correctional system than we need to. The last estimate of how much we spend in the correctional system is dated, but some $80 billion. Uh, it's easy to, to measure the money, right? Uh, but there are also a lot of impacts on communities. Communities are not as safe because we're not meeting the needs of people when they re-enter. We're not continuing their access to treatment or starting their access to treatment. Uh, there are implications for public health, employment, and so on. These results are so stark that they have actually started to drive impetus for change. And before I won't go on, I wanted to just share a little bit about like, why now? Why the momentum for this moment right now? I think it's a couple of things. Um, first, we have a healthcare system that because it covers more people, uh, has changed its focus on population health and really wants to, and sees itself as more accountable for managing the health of populations. And that leads naturally to looking at some of the people who are left out. There is far greater recognition of root causes of health, of the social determinants or health-related social needs, right? And so there's a lot more awareness than there was even 10 years ago of how different uh, systems intersect with each other to produce good or bad outcomes. That's on the health side. On the criminal justice side, things have changed too. We, uh, for a long time, uh, had extremely punitive approaches. Um, and the criminal justice system, over time, has really come to ha achieve greater recognition of second chances. April is Second Chance Month, um, and so very well-timed she'll be to have this conversation. Um, but there's a very strong interest in a lot of quarters in redemption, and how do we help people transition? Um, but it's not all philosophical. Um, if you talk, we, we talked to one uh, correctional leader, a former DOC head in a large western state, and he said, my job has changed. I've been in the system a long time. My job used to be how high and dense could I make the barbed wire around my facilities? And that's not my job anymore. My job now is to support successful transitions so that people don't keep coming back. If you talk to some sheriffs or wardens in the country, they may tell you how they feel, uh, which in a number of cases is they know that their jails are populated to a significant degree by people with mental health and substance use disorder. But here's what they see. People who are coming to their jails who have, who have sometimes very acute mental health issues, sometimes very acute substance use disorder, but their needs have not been met by the community health care system. So they come to prison and jail, which is not a setting that was designed to provide health care. So if you're a sheriff and a warden, you're suddenly being asked to provide health care in an environment that, it, that was not necessarily set up for it. And you, you know, in some cases, do the best you can, but it's not producing great outcomes. And when it doesn't produce great outcomes, some of those prison and jails are legally on the hook. Uh, and they get sued and they get litigated against. And so I think if you're a, some sheriff or warden, you're thinking, well, I'm trying to do the right thing here. Why am I the one that's getting sued when this person's needs haven't been met for years? And it's a legitimate question. Along with all of that is an interest, of course, in money. Uh, prisons and jails are funded not federally, unless, except for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Pris state prisons are funded by state governments. Jails are funded by local governments. And there's, so there's also a question here about resources. Are there resources in jails and prisons adequate to provide health care? Should this be, in some way, 
a federal responsibility. I'll give just two examples of how the system works now for two people, just as counterpoints for the different directions that the system can go in now. First, there was a man in Alabama who uh, had diabetes, and he was going into jail. His sister went to the jail with him, and she brought his diabetes medication uh, and said, as he was admitted to the jail, he needs to take his diabetes medication um, in order to be healthy. He goes into incarceration. Some time passes. He doesn't take his diabetes medication for some reason. Uh, and he gets very sick. When he is sick, he's released. When he's released, he goes to the hospital uh, and has a very expensive treatment that could have been avoided uh, by preventive measures. And then following that, he gets hit with a hospital bill. That's not a good outcome. Conversely, uh, and closer to home, there, are, there is a case that someone related to me recently here nearby in Middlesex County, Massachusetts, which uh, endeavors to connect people to services when they're inside, including <coughs> access to medication-assisted treatment, the evidence-based standard for OUD care. In that case, someone came in and had his needs met, uh, did better, had a, had a reentry plan coming out, uh, but couldn't find the community services to continue his treatment. Winds up back in, and he's, he's coming back in, he says, I'm happy to be back, because here I will get the services that I need. So we have these disconnects uh, between community and correctional, and we need to fill them. The promise of providing greater access to health care is that it will connect people to services and can generate a range of more positive outcomes than we're getting now. If you just look at the evidence around what happens when you connect someone in the criminal justice system or leaving the criminal justice system to services, you will see several things. First, rates of use of basic health and mental health services increase significantly. Um, second, there are lower rates of crime. Uh, there is greater longevity, especially when it comes to opioid overdose death rates and reduced emergency room hospital use. So there is great potential to help achieve community health outcomes in these new policies. One study that I like to, uh, to call out to people's attention is there was a very extensive analysis done in South Carolina of two groups of 19-year-old men. One group had Medicaid coverage, the other group lost it. The ones who retained Medicaid coverage had a 40% lower rate of incarceration than the ones who lost Medicaid coverage. And almost all of that change was attributable to the way in which Medicaid provided access to mental health services. Now, all of these examples are from the status quo. The status quo meaning there is an association between having Medicaid coverage and lower rates of crime. Having Medicaid coverage and better access. Uh, there is also going forward, and this is the question that the waivers really raise, is like once we start allowing Medicaid to actually cover services and provide continuity, what will the additional benefits that we see be? And I'll also point out that although I've focused on the impact on community health, there's also wish, uh, the potential for improvements of the healthcare of people inside of systems, inside of prisons and jails. Uh, and that can improve the safety in facilities. It could improve the health and well being of correctional officers, who I recently learned from my colleague, Nika Jones Tapia, the former warden of the Cook County Jail. Correctional officers have a life expectancy that is, on average, 20 years lower than that of the general population. So it's another indication of the gaps in the system and what's happening to people when we don't fill them. Let's talk about why Medicaid is the lever for promoting access to health care for people in the justice system. Oh, sorry. 
having a PowerPoint malfunction. <laughs> I'm surprised it took me this long to have <laughs> okay. okay. Medicaid, as you all know, is the health and long-term care insurance program for low-income Americans. Currently, it covers about 85 million Americans, or one in every five people in the United States. Um, it is a major financer of health care in the United States, accounts for about one in every six dollars that we spend on health care. And health care itself is a huge part of the American economy. 17% of our gross domestic poly, uh, product is spent specifically on health care. Uh, why do I call that out to you? Because Medicaid is a lever for change. Medicaid plays an even bigger role for some services, financing about a quarter of mental health and a quarter of substance use treatment in the United States. Um, so it is a powerful lever. But historically, uh, Medicaid has been prohibited from paying for any services other than hospital services when someone's incarcerated. So you can be a Medicaid beneficiary. You can even, in many places, stay enrolled in Medicaid. But once you come into prison and jail, your coverage turns off. Now, estimates are vary, and aren't, the data is not great. But in some states, it's been estimated that as many as 80 to 90 percent of people who are in prison and jail are eligible for Medicaid. Remember what I said a few minutes ago, that incarceration is associated with being low income. So what this means is that uh, Medicaid has had some constraints and hasn't been able to meet the needs of a significant share of the population that it is designed to serve. So those are the wonky Medicaid basics. I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about why Medicaid can be effective um, in expanding this new role. If you were to look back at all of the research that's been done on Medicaid impact and Medicaid's impact over time, and yes, I do enjoy doing that, um, you would find literally hundreds of studies that show that Medicaid has helped extend lives decrease mortality, address issues like HIV, address public health, saved rural hospitals from closures. I could go on and on and on, but the point is that Medicaid over time has been a major lever for change. Time and again, Congress, the federal government, the executive branch, and states have turned to Medicaid to help address major national goals. Let's go back to the early 1970s when Congress perceived that it had a military readiness issue, specifically that people were coming into military service unprepared and unhealthy. It created an entire benefit, uh, pediatric benefits for children, the most comprehensive benefit on the health insurance market, specifically because it wanted people to grow up healthy and the pool of military recruits who are qualified to increase. Over time, Medicaid's been built on time and time again to address issues like breast and cervical cancer, HIV, most recently, of course, COVID, and to respond to emerging threats. After 9-11, disaster relief Medicaid came into being and, and was a buttress for people in New York City. After Hurricane Katrina, same thing. The point is we've built on it time and time again and it's a natural tool for policymakers to turn to. It brings both national reach and the ability for states to tailor it to their needs. And with that comes sustainable financing. Many services in prisons and jails could benefit from sustainable financing. Uh, some of the issues that we face now are because the services are funded with local funding, state funding, grant funding, and those dollars ebb and flow, and they go away over time. The potential of Medicaid is to bring a sustainable financing source. But as we'll talk about in a second, financing alone is not enough. Uh, with that financing comes standards for accountability and standards for quality, and the ability to measure progress over time, all of which are needed when it comes to correctional and community health care. Now I'm going to turn to the changes, the policy changes that are taking place. And I know that you all came here to talk about the waivers, but I wanted to start with, require, with new policies that are applying every place in the United States, not just in states 
that have, that are, have sought waivers. The first changes are designed to help youth who are leaving the justice system. People who are under age 21 or former foster care youth who are under age 26. Starting in January, every state in the country is required to work with their prisons and jails and juvenile justice facilities and youth detention to make sure every youth receives case management services before they leave and screenings and diagnostics for physical health, behavioral health, and dental services to set them up for a successful community return. I linger on this for two reasons. Uh, the first is that these changes could potentially change life trajectories. The population of people in that 18 to 21 age group face high rates of incarceration. Um, and if you're able to connect them to healthcare services, it could really be a game changer for them. So it's a high impact policy. But the second reason that I bring it to your attention is the January deadline. Uh, because this particular provision has gotten less attention than the waivers, but making it actually work until some of the same complexity of the waivers. We have to bring the health and the criminal justice systems together to implement these. So I, my ask of you is that you put this higher on the radar screen, put this higher on the priority list. Whether you're a state official, local official advocate, there needs to be faster movement for change here. The second set of changes are much more recent. They were enacted as part of the budget law that Congress passed just last month. Um, and they really reflect, I think, a recognition on Congress's part that there is interest in many, many parts of the country across a broad section of stakeholders, bipartisan interest in achieving continuity of care. And to, but to achieve continuity of care, people have to be enrolled in Medicaid. Historically, states have been given an option. They can either, when someone's incarcerated, put their the person's enrollment in hiatus temporarily so that it can be reactivated when they get released, or they could terminate that coverage and just end it. And then that person has to reapply for Medicaid someday, not necessarily as they're being released, but maybe years later when they have a very acute need. And so Congress responded this year by requiring all states to suspend Medicaid coverage. It also invested the first ever grant funding in helping the health and criminal justice systems work together to achieve these changes. And it recognized that even in states that are suspending eligibility, it's not always succeeding. It's actually really hard to turn coverage off and turn back on. And so it, it provided more than $100 million in grant funds that would go to state Medicaid agencies next year in order for them to collaborate with their criminal justice partners and others to start making these connections stronger. Now we can talk about the waivers. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet uh, to listen to Meta and Sophia's excellent webinar on 1115 waivers um, that I think got sent around, uh, you really need to do that. Uh, I'm not going to do it justice. I'm just going to say briefly what I think a waiver is, fundamentally. Uh, waiver is a tool by which the federal government lets states depart from federal Medicaid law. Fundamentally, Congress has said that the federal agency that administers Medicaid, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, can stand in Congress's shoes and make some degree of decisions about what laws states follow and which ones they don't. That is very unusual. You may have noticed that it's way more typical for Congress to provide a lot of, a lot of specific guidance to, to agencies about how they administer their programs. But in this case, uh, CMS has some authority. And it indicated last year, just about a year ago, an interest in making stronger connections to services at reentry by letting states waive the inmate exclusions. There's a process involved. A state has to make a proposal to CMS, tell them what it wants to do, and then there's a, a negotiation where the federal government talks about its goals, the state talks about its goals, the state talks about its ground level reality, and then the results of that negotiation are written up in what's essentially a contract between the federal government and a state 
and that contract is codified in a waiver approval. Uh, there has been a groundswell of state interest in these waivers. Even before CMS put out its guidance, at least 10 states had submitted proposals. Uh, California and Washington's waivers were approved last year. They were the first. Uh, and Montana's waiver was approved just a few weeks ago. Federal policy specified some of the conditions under which CMS is willing to approve waivers. And this was after CMS gave a lot of thought to how are we actually going to do this. So here's the deal that they're prepared to offer to states. Uh, starting in up to the 90 days before someone's released, Medicaid will start covering <laughs> services. Specifically, it will start covering case management, which is a service that's designed to identify and support people in accessing a range of health and social services. Medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. As you all know, it's the, it's the standard of care uh, for people with opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder and has proven highly effective in reducing overdoses. And then the third element is a 30-day supply of prescriptions at release so that a person is walking out the door of a prison and jail with a medication supply. Those are the three de minimis services that CMS is asking states to cover. States have discretion to determine which Medicaid beneficiaries get these services, which correctional facilities provide them, and who the provider is. And you can find more detail about all of this in the, in the webinar, which I recommend to you. So because of the CMS policy and the state interest in waivers, we're sitting at this groundbreaking moment. As we've discussed, the current set of outcomes is extremely undesirable. We can do better. But how do we do better? How do we actually take this moment and turn it into the type of transformational change that the millions of people who are leaving the justice system need to make? Um, it, it all comes down to implementation, essentially. There are 2,000 prisons in the United States, 3,000 jails. Uh, none of them look like any of the others of them. If you're a Medicaid person, you've you know, heard for millions of years, if you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program. Turns out, people say the same thing about jails. If you've seen one jail, you've seen one jail. They vary enormously in their approach, capacity, and level of resources. And so the challenge that needs to be tackled is how do we bridge these silos in a way that actually achieves change for people but also takes into account the needs of the different people and entities who are going to be implementing them. I said a minute ago that, uh, that there was broad stakeholder support for these policies from unusual quarters. There's bipartisan support for these policies. So we stand here now, we've got a groundswell of interest, we've got unprecedented stakeholder alignment, we've got bipartisan uh, alignment, which you can say about very, very few things in the United States of America right now. So how do we meet that interest? How do we meet that momentum to actually start improving lives? Two years ago, the Health and Reentry Project asked 70 stakeholders that exact question. We sat down with state Medicaid directors, public health leaders, sheriffs, state DOCs, people who'd been directly impacted, community providers and reentry service providers to ask them, if Medicaid policy is going to change, how should it work? We did not ask them, how do we get this to work? Because we don't want to just make connections really early. We want to know how should this work? And so what people aligned around was a care model. And I will say, we went into this conversation a little bit nervous. You don't really know what's going to happen when you're bringing wardens and DOCs together with uh, community providers and social justice advocates and people who've been incarcerated. Um, but once we got in a room and started talking about how, there was really, really broad alignment. And so we used that alignment and boiled it down to a care model. So here's what we heard when we asked the question, how should this work? People should be connected to primary care as they're leaving, and that primary care connection should, should include seamless connections to behavioral health services. 
there needs to be active patient engagement and navigation, helping the person to navigate the many systems that they are going to need to interact with to support their recovery. Because there are high rates of trauma in the justice system, it's best to start with trauma-informed approaches. And wherever possible, there should be connections to integrated health and social supports. So that's it. That's our North Star for, for implementation. Can we get to this goal? And I, although I call it a North Star, I do it guardedly. Because honestly, there is no one model here. And I think sometimes people who start to work in implementation come expecting a roadmap. HARP has been working with 10 of the counties in California that are among the first in the country to implement this work. And uh, we met with them in October. It was great. Some of them seemed to come in the expectation that there was going to be a model uh, and that they were going to have some preset course to follow. Sadly, that's not the case. Um, there is no roadmap. There are some really promising models out there. There is some great work that has been done um, to connect people to services at reentry. Um, but it hasn't been enough. It hasn't scaled. The models have been localized. And we need to learn from those models and bake in the best of them. But also, we have to evolve. And here's why. We have never before dedicated ourselves specifically to the purpose of meeting the needs of this population. And guess what? Although I describe a high degree of alignment across stakeholders, people who are incarcerated, many of them, not all, do not trust these systems. They have low rates of trust of the healthcare system. They have low rates of trust of the criminal justice system. And that's what we have to navigate. And that's the nut we have to crack to really make these systems work for people. The systems also have to work, importantly, for the people who are implementing them. And I keep coming back to that point because although it's incredibly heartening that there's so much alignment around these issues now, the surest way to lose that alignment and to lose momentum is to have people unprepared for the tasks ahead and to find that it's too hard. Our 70 stakeholders also had a little bit to say about how we implement. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to identify some of the key points, we have to align healthcare services that are providing corrections with those that are provided in the community. I'm going to say that really quickly as though it's easy. It's not. Um, hats off to Alex Duncan, who's here in the room, and Pew Charitable Trusts. They dedicated us to the task specifically for opioid use disorder services of identifying how we can translate community standards into a correctional environment. Um, and it was great work. It's up on our website. We need to recognize that there is broad diversity in the criminal justice system, and prisons and jails are very different. We have, there have to be investments in systems and infrastructure to promote continuity of care. One strength of the CMS guidance is that it allows states to obtain upfront investments to help with one-time implementation costs. That's an essential ingredient of success. We need to invest in community-based care and the workforce. Both the health and the criminal justice systems have <coughs> historic staffing shortages now, uh, which makes this a difficult time to do this work, but also a promising time, because we're going to develop new models. And there needs to be coordination and measurement and evaluation. Not just measurement and evaluation of health outcomes, but measurement over time of criminal justice and other outcomes. That's a lot. Uh, we're going to put some of this in an implementation fact sheet that will be up on our website in a few weeks. My communications consultant, whenever I say that, says, Vicki, that's nice that you're writing an implementation fact sheet. No one's actually going to read it. Um, so I'm calling it out to you so you can help me prove her wrong. <laughs> but also, because she gave me that guidance, I felt the need to just boil down uh, what I call the four C's of effective implementation. The first C is commitment, meaning if you're going to do this work, you have to be ready to roll up your sleeves, tackle new challenges, sail through uncharted territory, and work hard, not just in year one, but over time as we build a system for people who are in the justice system. The second, and I cannot emphasize this strongly enough, is collaboration. Uh, there has to be meetings like this um, and much more that bring together Medicaid agencies, public health, behavioral health, 
juvenile justice, jails, prisons, community corrections, courts, prosecutors, public defenders, Medicaid managed care organizations, uh, community providers, social justice advocates, and critically, both people who have been incarcerated and people who have been victims of crimes. Carmel talked earlier about the need, how much stronger policy is when it comes up from the community level. There has to be everyone at the table. Um, I won't belabor the metaphor, because the metaphor I kept coming back to is we have to set a big table. Uh, and I, I tried to challenge myself to come up with a better metaphor. And I realized the reason that I rely on that is because of my Thanksgiving dinners. I grew up in a really small family, two kids, dog. Uh, grandparents lived across the street. Our holidays were very sedate affairs. I married a man who has 12 siblings and step-siblings, two parents, two step-parents. Uh, and when we married, that was the total number. As time went on, it multiplied. <laughs> Everyone had kids. Some people remarried. Uh, he's got cousins. And so when we reached the time of life at which uh, we decided we were mature enough to begin hosting holiday meals, he said, well, guess what? We're inviting everyone to Thanksgiving. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, he said, no, everyone, everyone is going to come for Thanksgiving, or at least they're going to be invited. And so I took some time to come to terms with that. Um, and here's what our Thanksgivings look like now. Huge groups of people, Christian, Jewish, black, white, queer, cis, Trump, anti-Trump, people who hear very well, people who can't hear at all. <laughs> people who are polite, people who aren't, people who love conflict, people who avoid it at all costs. It's a very, very big and diverse group. Uh, my house will never be mistaken for a banquet hall. Uh, and so that means that we're all sitting crowded around these relatively small tables. Uh, and you know what? People love it. You know what? I look back on my Thanksgiving as of my youth, and I'm like, well, that was boring. <laughs> <laughs> this is really much, much more interesting. And how do I know people love it? Admittedly, they don't seem to love my Brussels sprouts, but I do, so I keep <laughs> making them. They love it because they're together and because they have discourse, and they keep coming back. And so I know that's not a perfect metaphor for what you're doing, but I think that the goal here is to bring everyone together um, and to, to be open and to listen and to try to chart a course together. Here's where that metaphor totally breaks down, though, is that in addition to all of the system actors that you need to reach out to, there are many people who either feel left out of the system or feel that the system has done them some disservice. And they need to be there, too. So it's not just inviting your family for Thanksgiving. It's inviting the people who don't like your Brussels sprouts. It's inviting the people who don't even like turkey. right? You have to really, really signal to people uh, welcomeness in order to get together and build these services. OK, now you know way too much about me. Um, community services is the third C. The risk here is that we spend so much time trying to get things to work in a jail that we don't, in fact, focus enough on the community side. The services in a prison and jail should be the springboard to the community. And we need to fill the pool so that when people springboard off, there's the services there to catch them. And finally, creativity. Uh, we need to, to really proactively think about how we're going to do this. And we need to come up with new approaches. Because as I said earlier, there's no one model. I wanted to just end with how the system could work if we dedicate ourselves to this task. I think that we can get to a place where we no longer see people coming into the justice system with unmet health needs. I think we can get to a place where people get their services in the communities and we're not relying on jails and prisons. I think we can support people at release in achieving their, uh, their own life ambitions and the requirements of the justice system going forward. And I think we can connect people to not just healthcare, but all of the services they need, nutrition, housing, employment, and more. Here's two voices uh, that I've heard from recently about what this could look like. First, over the weekend, I um, heard a recording of Sheriff Carl Leonard from Chesterfield County, Virginia. Uh, he has implemented medication-assisted treatment in his jail. And here's how he measures his outcomes. 
people leave my facility healthy, and then months later, they come back and they show me their pay stubs. They've been able to get jobs. They've been able to succeed in moving forward. And that's impressive and compelling. He said even one person was so happy with the treatment she got that she voted for him. <laughs> now, that's powerful. <laughs> um, a second set of voices is from the state of Ohio, which pioneered an approach of having their Medicaid managed care organizations provide pre-release services. They didn't actually provide the services in jails. They just set people up for the outside. Afterwards, it did surveys and focus groups with the beneficiaries who received their services. And here's what they said. This solved all the stomach issues that I have had for years. This allowed me to provide for my family so that I didn't have to consider criminal activity to support them. This gave me the services so that I could get clean. And having Medicaid coverage made me feel like I was being, 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 I was being treated like a human being. Those are incredibly powerful impacts, and I think make it well worth the work that's ahead. Uh, I would be remiss if before concluding, I didn't just <coughs> share with you that there are many, many more resources that go into even greater depth than I have this morning available on the Health and Reentry Project's website. We've been lucky to have very supportive funders, and you can see their names up here. And then you can go to the Health and Reentry Project website or email me or Margo at any time, and we're happy to talk more about these issues. I am looking forward to all of the panelists and hearing what all of you have to say over the course of the day. I know we don't have time for questions, um, but I hope that you feel free to come up and chat, give me feedback, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you all, and I'm looking forward to the day.